教授，那下面我们就开始进行下午的这个课程的部分。然后第一部分呢，还是由 Leo 给大家带来关于 WebGL 还有 WebCL 的一些内容。好，谢谢。Hi everyone. So let's get、uh, this afternoon going with the web APIs. So as we briefly mentioned this morning, the、uh, HTML5 is quickly becoming one of the most important programming environments for、uh, applications that are portable to many different platforms and operating systems. And over the next few years, as、uh, mobile silicon becomes cheaper. And lower power, it's going to be possible to build these chips into more and more diverse types of devices. So this need for a cross-platform environment is going to become more and more important. And many、um, platform vendors don't like the thought of cross-OS portability. They don't want their applications to be easily portable. So there's a tension between. OS vendors and the needs of developers, and HTML5 could be、uh, the one environment that ends up being supported on many different operating systems、uh, because people have wanted good functionality in the browser. But it means that as HTML5 changes in character from being a web standard into being a programming framework, real applications, we need to bring. More and more functionality into the browser. All the kinds of functionality that we've been discussing this morning, such as 3D graphics, video processing, vision processing, sensor fusion.、Uh, how are we going to get all of this functionality into HTML5 browsers quickly? Well, one way to do it is to not reinvent the APIs. But simply expose the APIs that we have already in native into、uh, the web environment, typically through JavaScript.、Uh, as you probably know, JavaScript is the programming language that gets used in HTML5 browsers, and so WebGL is the first example of this way of bringing new functionality into the web by defining a JavaScript binding. Into OpenGL VS 2.0,、uh, we can create a 3D API for web content, and there's other opportunities too.、Uh, defining a web API for OpenCL,、uh, which is the project、uh, WebCL, we can bring compute into the browser. There are lots of browser function initiatives. Many of them are at the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, companies like Google and Zilla are proposing audio standards. We can make sure those audio standards are accelerated well by Open Max. There are 2D vector graphic APIs such as Canvas and SVG already in HTML5. We should work with the web community to make sure that they can be accelerated over OpenGLES or OpenVG. And then other possible projects. Is thinking, well. The web is going to need great camera control and image processing. Perhaps we could work with the W3C to create a web max,、uh, a binding into Open Max AL. Sorry, or we could、uh, create a binding to Open VL vision processing,、uh, binding to sensor fusion、uh, through stream input.、Um, so I think this will be a very active area. Cooperation between Cronos and W3C、uh, over the next、uh, few years. But the first project that we have is WebGL. WebGL is actually here today.、Uh, WebGL comes from the web it,、uh, making great advances and OpenGL ES becoming available everywhere for functionality. To be useful for a web browser vendor, it has to be available everywhere. A web browser runs everywhere. So until 3D graphics functionality became available everywhere, the browser vendors couldn't include it、uh, in the browser itself. But now we have OpenGL 
or OpenGL ES 2.0 available anywhere that a browser can run. Combine that with the canvas tag in HTML5. The canvas tag, for the first time, gives us a surface that we can write individual pixels. Before the canvas tag, we could write text or images, but we didn't have pixel level control. The canvas tag gives us that control. Now we can create an API that generates 3D pixels uh, into the canvas. And then lastly, JavaScript performance in the browser has been getting faster and faster over the last few years, order of magnitude faster. Now JavaScript is easily fast enough for writing quite complex uh, web applications. So all these factors come together. Pervasive 3D, very competent HTML5, canvas tag. Now we can create a 3D context for the canvas. Uh, that is uh, WebGL. WebGL 1.0 was released at uh, GDC in March 2011. So it's just one year old, already being widely used. Uh, Tom gave some of the history of OpenGL ES. It took four or five years for OpenGL ES to be widely distributed through the industry. It's happening much faster for WebGL than it did for OpenGL ES. We're building on the momentum of OpenGL ES to really make WebGL go very fast. So how does it look? How do you implement WebGL? Uh, WebGL is implemented by the browser vendors. So you use the drivers in the system, OpenGL drivers or OpenGL ES drivers. Uh, if your system has DirectX and no OpenGL or OpenGL ES, there's an open source project called Angle for Google, uh, which gives you OpenGL ES 2.0, uh, fully conformant uh, over DirectX 9. So even if you have a system without a native OpenGL, you can still get OpenGL ES2 functionality. Then the browser vendors implement these blue boxes. So the traditional elements of an HTML5 browser, the HTML layout engine, uh, the CSS, that's the cascading style sheets layout engine, the JavaScript engine for programmability, and now that's joined with WebGL. The browser has become a full 3D player. You don't need a plugin, and that's the big difference between WebGL and some of the previous attempts to bring 3D onto the web, uh, such as Verma. Then the application developers can then call into WebGL uh, through JavaScript. The application developers have the choice. You can call WebGL directly, or you can go through JavaScript middleware. And there are many different JavaScript frameworks already uh, beginning to appear to make it easier to generate uh, WebGL content. I think if you are a uh, experienced 3D program and you already know OpenGL ES, then writing in WebGL very soon you will find it very familiar. It's all the same constructs and ideas just uh, in JavaScript. Uh, if you're a not an expert 3D programmer but a web programmer, you'll probably find it easier to use some of the uh, middleware libraries that are already shipping in the industry. So how does the content make its way onto uh, your screen in a typical browser? The traditional content, the text and the images, uh, are sent through the layout engine and are typically drawn in situ directly into the screen memory. The new generation content, uh, the video tag, or uh, hardware accelerated video playback, uh, the canvas tag, which has a 2D vector API built in, or now WebGL, are typically generated off screen. And Canvas and WebGL, they both use JavaScript as the programming language and use JavaScript to drive the interactivity. The JavaScript program, just like in native, will generate a new frame every 30th of a second, every 60th of a second. 
the browser, every time it generates a frame on screen, will then bring all the elements together, composite them together, send them through the layout engine, and drop them into the final display uh, web page. And in the modern browsers, that composition is also being accelerated by the GPU. So the really exciting thing about WebGL is that it's a full part of the browser stack. When we had 3D as a plugin, verbal content, uh, it was always in a separate rectangular window. You couldn't have the web content interacting with the 3D content. They were separate because the plugin architecture was very limited. Now, 3D is a fundamental part of the browser. You can underlay and overlay 2D and 3D content. For example, you can use a frame from a video tag as a texture. Uh, you can use a canvas as a texture. And you can now, even at Google and Mozilla have a prototype where you can render a full web page, a live web page, as an OpenGL DS texture. So you can begin to manipulate full web content in 3D using WebGL. So I've seen a demo where you have a book and the pages curl nicely to connect live web pages with all the videos and then links continuing to work. So it's just an early example of how the user interface for the web is going to be fundamentally affected by the availability of WebGL. Well, I have one demo of, uh, well, it's a video of a demo, but I made it yesterday. Um, it's, actually, it's more than a demo. It's a full production piece of software. It's uh, Google Maps. Google Maps is already shipping uh, with WebGL. So this is an example. This is Rome uh, in Italy. If you zoom in, to a satellite view. Now, you get close enough to certain sites. You have a full 3D model that you can look at from different angles. Uh, this is all being rendered real time in WebGL. This is not a prototype Google Maps. This is the real live Google Maps that hundreds of millions of people are using every day. You zoom in close enough and you automatically transition to a street view, you're looking around the 3D environment as you move from point to point in the 3D environment, all the transformations as you move from one point to the other, like that, everything is being accelerated in, in WebGL, providing this really smooth, interactive uh, experience. And don't forget, this isn't an application, this is a web page. This is a web page running in your browser. And it will run on uh, any browser that has WebGL and HTML5 capability. It really shows you how you can go from a simple 2D map into a full 3D interactive experience uh, in a very portable way. So how is WebGL being deployed? Um, again, WebGL is only one year old, but already it's shipping in uh, most production <coughs> desktop browsers uh, on PCs. So Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, now all have uh, production uh, WebGL. The one missing is Microsoft and Internet Explorer. Uh, there is no barrier. Uh, to Microsoft adopting WebGL, and we hope that they will adopt it uh, very soon. I think this year, just like OpenCL, this year is going to be where uh, WebGL begins to appear in mobile browsers, uh, on mobile devices. And we're already beginning to see that happen at uh, MWC in Barcelona last week. Uh, the Opera announced that their Opera mobile browser now fully supports WebGL. Uh, Mozilla, Firefox, mobile browser, 
as WebGL. I know Google are working on it, and the other browser vendors too. So over the course of the next 12 months, you're going to find WebGL on desktop systems and mobile systems. So I mentioned uh, earlier that there are lots of frameworks and tools built in JavaScript. If you don't want to go down to the full level of OpenGL ES2, you can use a higher level framework. Um, the Kronos web page has uh, a wiki where people add uh, frameworks as they have them. Um, it grows by one or two frameworks every week. Um, there are some ones that are proving to be most popular. Uh, 3.js is an extremely popular one that's being used by more and more applications. And I should mention, all of these slides from today are going to be available on the Kronos website uh, by uh, end of tomorrow. And so all these links, you'll be able to download these slides and, and go to these links and find uh, these resources. So security has been a big debate around WebGL. There's been some confusing comments in the press about WebGL security. Uh, but let me make it clear, WebGL is 100% secure. There is no known security problem with WebGL. The, there are potential problems with driver bugs, uh, but the browser vendors are working very closely with the GPU vendors to make sure if there are any problems discovered, we can very quickly uh, fix them. We have white lists blacklists of different GPU drivers uh, so we can turn off WebGL in certain browser combinations if there is a problem. We haven't found any uh, yet. Uh, but it is an interesting comment that when we expose new functionality in the browser, there is always the potential for bugs to be discovered and exploited. And in this case, we are exposing a lot of new software. It's the driver graphics driver has never been exposed quite this directly to the web before. But it's not just WebGL. If you use the GPU for accelerating canvas or stage 3D in Flash or Silverlight or just GPU compositing in the HTML stack, there is the potential for uh, GPU driver bugs. But so far so good. And the, the Kronos group is watching very closely to make sure that we don't have any uh, serious problems and we resolve them quickly if any are, are discovered. So don't believe the press. Uh, there's been press out there saying WebGL is not secure. Uh, someone could write a WebGL shader to write over your disk drive. Um, it's just not possible to write a shader that accesses your system disk drive. So uh, don't believe the press. Uh, WebGL is completely secure. There are some other uh, interesting projects that are going to use WebGL. Uh, Declarative 3D for the web is a new W3C project uh, that actually puts the 3D scene graph into the HTML5 database. It's called the DOM, the Document Object Model. So your 3D scene becomes an intimate part of the, the DOM database. This is a very familiar way of working for many web developers. And I think it will make 3D content easier for many developers uh, to create. But X3DOM will use WebGL uh, for acceleration. So we have this interesting symmetry. Uh, the 2D APIs, SVG is a scene graph API. Canvas API is an immediate mode API, just like OpenGL or WebGL. Uh, X3DOM is going to be a C draft API that goes over WebGL, just like SVG complements Canvas, C draft or immediate in 2D or 3D. Uh, it's an interesting building out of the APIs available to the web community. The other interesting, uh, interesting need. Uh, that WebGL is creating is the need to transmit 3D assets across the network, such as the internet. 
If we want to send audio across the internet, we have compressed formats like MP3. If you want to send video across the internet, we have lots of compressed formats like H.264. Uh, images, we can use JPEG or a PNG. But if you want to send a large 3D model across the internet to a WebGL player, there is currently no widely accepted 3D compressed stream data format. It's an interesting problem. Now, MPEG, you find all of these. And they've been working on uh, MPEG 4 Part 16 for eight years to find 3D compressed uh, data formats. But they're not being used. And we don't really understand why. So we have a meeting next week between Kronos and MPEG where we're going to explore what we need to do to fill in this hole. Uh, we really need something quickly, else there's going to be a real confusion of lots of different data formats being used throughout the industry. So this is another project that the Kronos members will be involved with. So we have WebGL. Uh, we will now also have WebCL. WebCL is much newer. We, we haven't released the specification yet. Uh, it's still under construction. We're planning to ship it this year. It's a JavaScript binding into OpenCL and it could be used for compute, just like OpenCL. So physics engines, image processing, video processing in the browser become GPU accelerated if you have WebCL. And I'll show you another video. So we haven't released the specification yet, but we do have prototypes. So this is a prototype from Samsung Electronics um, in California, and this is running on a Mac. It's running in Safari browser uh, as a prototype uh, environment. So this demonstration starts with a simple web WebGL demo where we have a 3D environment. Uh, this is Union Square in San Francisco, and there are two spheres. So this is a simple WebGL program. You can see, even though this is a web page, this is you know, being rotated at 60 frames a second. Now we deform these spheres. A lot of floating point calculation is needed to turn these spheres into jelly. Uh, that they're wobbling. Uh, a lot of floating point overloading the JavaScript uh, computation and the frame rate drops right down to about half frame a second. If we use WebCL and take those floating point computation back onto the GPU, the frame rate goes up a hundred times. The GPU, not surprisingly, is a lot faster than the JavaScript for heavy floating point. So we can get the mix of compute for physics and other computation and 3D graphics WebCL, WebGL working together, you can see that this is going to be the foundation for many interesting 3D applications running in the browser. So uh, there are lots of resources around uh, WebCL, there are a number of open source prototypes. Again, you'll be able to download these uh, if you get the slides from the Kronos website. So now we have the last piece of this compute and graphics ecosystem, we have GL for graphics, CL for compute, available on desktop systems, available in mobile systems, and now available in the web. I think this is going to create a real opportunity. It's going to change the mobile industry again. Lots of people want their native apps on their iPhone or their Android device. They're fast and they're beautiful and they're interactive. Uh, better than a web page, right? Uh, but with HTML5 technologies like WebGL, you're going to be able to design a web page that's just as beautiful, just as well laid out, just as interactive as a native app. And it will be portable to any device. And your application can run as an app or a web page. People can discover your app just by Google searching. Um, you don't have to go through an app store if you don't want to. You have the choice. Uh, I think this is going to change the economy of the mobile market in very significant ways. 
And I think a, a number of companies are already beginning to realize this. Uh, there are many companies now building tools and frameworks and billing systems, independent storefronts, language tools for converting between C and JavaScript um, to really enable this ecosystem of JavaScript applications to really be uh, enabled. It's very early days. Every day there's new announcements of new startup companies uh, doing tools in this kind of um, uh, area. And PhoneGap, for example, uh, is a company that was established with JavaScript bindings into system resources before they became part of standard HTML5. A lot of people use it. Adobe just purchased PhoneGap. So Adobe has stated too that HTML5 is the direction for rich media and graphics uh, on the web. So my final slide here, it's kind of interesting how different parts of the industry are coming together to make HTML5 this world-changing platform. The browser vendors are shipping HTML5 in the browser. The operating system vendors are beginning to ship HTML5 capable browsers on their operating systems. A whole bunch of companies doing tools and frameworks. And then last but not least, of course, the hardware community through the kernels group creating these acceleration APIs and making them available to, to the web community. You bring all these four things together and you create a HTML5 opportunity for the industry. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.